Good morning. I now call to order the meeting of the Curriculum Committee for Wednesday, April 15th, 2020, in accordance with the mandated direction of the State Superintendent, Baltimore County Public Schools and offices are closed to the public and non-essential personnel through April 24th, 2020 in order to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff. In accordance with the Board of Education's resolution approved at the March 10th, 2020 board meeting of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair, in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent, may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members, subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, today's curriculum committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through live stream on the BCPS website or on BCPS TV, Comcast Infinity Channel 73, Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this morning will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Cox, Please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum. Of the um, is Ms. Pastor here? Yes. Yes, present. Ms. Lisa Mack? Yes, present. Mr. Omar Rashid? Mr. Rob McMillan? Yes. Mr. John Offerman? Yes. Thank you, Ms. Cox. Ms. Cox, please call the roll of staff members participating in today's meeting. Dr. Mary McComas? Yes, present. Dr. Renard Adams? Here. Mr. Ryan Imbrielli? Present. Ms. Megan Shea? Present. Dr. Melissa Whitstead? Present. Okay. That's all we have. Thank you, Ms. Cox. I am now going to turn this over to Dr. McComas, who will get us underway with the first presentation on continuity of learning with Dr. Adams, Ms. Shea, Dr. Wistead, and Mr. Embriali, who will be our presenters. Thank you. Good morning. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> I, I am having uh, connectivity issues out here, strangely. Okay, so good morning, everyone, and thank you, Ms. Pasteur and uh, Ms. Mack, Mr. Alferman, and Mr. McMillian for taking some time with us today so that we could uh, not only take care of some typical cur um, curriculum committee business, but also, uh, most importantly and most urgently, our continuity of learning plan. And so my team and I will um, take turns discussing different aspects of our plan today as we move forward. So Jim, if you could go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, as we know, just to kind of walk through uh, the situation that all of us have been in as a community, we know that COVID-19 pandemic has erupted around the, the globe. And um, because of that, um, School systems in Maryland experience an emergency closure 
Uh, that um, on March 13th, the end of the day on Friday, March 13th, we were to close for two weeks at that point as an emergency response for two reasons. One, to help mitigate the spread of the disease, and then two, to allow deep cleaning and sanitization of air school facilities. We then know that um, during the Wednesday of, let me look at my calendar here, um, Wednesday, I believe it was March 18th, uh, the state superintendent in conjunction with the uh, governor announced that schools would remain closed for weeks through April 24th. And that school systems were in the process of developing a continuity of learning plan that would um, engage students in learning moving forward um, as people need to stay at home. And it, so we will be going over those things. And then in addition, we will touch base uh, very briefly on uh, how we are looking at summer learning and where we are in that planning process and where we are in terms of planning for re-entry or return to the typical school setting. And so if I could go to the next slide, Jim. Thank you. And again, uh, what we have here in this slide is it really walks through that history. As we said, March 12th, the state superintendent announced that we would be closing for two weeks. Um, and at that point, we as school systems had only 24 hours to gather whatever materials we wanted to send with students um, for a two-week closure. Now, how we responded to that situation, fortunately, uh, just about a week prior, Dr. Williams had um, asked me to begin planning for the potential disruption of school um, because of the COVID-19. And so at that point, we had no idea if schools would be disrupted, but we um, recognized that we need to start preparing in the event that something should happen. And it was entirely unknown at that point, would they be closed and if so, for how long? And so fortunately, our leadership um, set us out in the right direction and um, Ms. Shea and I began um, discussing and working with the content offices about one week prior to the 13th. Um, in that process, we had the content teams develop resources for students that would cover three weeks of instruction. And the reason we provided three weeks was because we thought any closure might potentially be two to three weeks and three weeks at a minimum would have taken us at that point up to what would have been our normal spring break. So we thought that Three weeks was a good stretch of work, um, but at that point, because it was really um, unforeseen at how long this process would go on, we made all of the work review and reinforcement exercises of standards and skills that students had been working on. Um, so that way, we would not be disadvantaging uh, students. We would just be giving them more opportunity to grow stronger in the um, standards and skills that they had already been working on. Um, and at that point, we did not um, intend to grade any of that because, again, this was a temporary closure and the idea was practice. Um, at that point, those materials were developed and we were able to get them posted on the Baltimore County website um, by Monday, March 16th. All those resources were available and they were quite extensive. We had resources from um, pre-K all the way through grade 12 in the core areas and the core required courses at the secondary level. Um, the, uh, the Additionally, those materials that were posted were in printable PDF format, so families could print them off at home as a resource. Thank you. If Jim, you could go to the next slide. Thank you. And moving forward again on March 25th, when Dr. Salmon announced that schools would remain closed until the 24th, um, we had already, uh, fortunately, had prepared for that third week of work um, that would have taken us up to the original spring break. And so for the very first week of the new cycle, um, we actually had work already available for students. So in response, um, uh, under Dr. Williams' leadership, we began to develop our continuity of learning plan, which would then engage students in new learning. So learning objectives that they had not yet had, but that would build on prerequisite skills and, and content standards that they had already been working on and learned. Um, and at that point, we acknowledged that we would need to use our, our learning management system, which we typically refer to as Schoology, because that's the particular product that we use for our learning management 
and that we would leverage that to the greatest extent possible because at that point it became obvious that it's unclear how long, in fact, our extended closure will go on, um, and that we would continue to offer resources in print format um, as a foundational approach because we also recognize that not all students have digital access at their home, but that um, those families that do have that access, we, we want to provide, um, if you will, a multi, a multiple entry points into the work for our families given the wide uh, diversity of um, resources available to families. So if, if you could go on to the next slide, Jim. And so our framework overall for our continuity of learning plan um, is really um, to provide for our youngest learners, preschool students um, through grade two um, packets. And the reason the primary approach for those grade levels was packets is because as you are aware, um, our device ratio at those grade levels is not one-to-one. -one. Uh, we are really in a one to about five or six per class. And so we did not actually have the hardware uh, ratio to be able to issue those and, and um, provide everything through the learning management system. Um, and as many of you know, that was a journey to the place where we are in terms of ratio. Um, our students in our special education thousand and cows programs would also primarily receive packets because of their um, capacity. Our separate day schools would, uh, students would receive packets. Students in grades three and five would have packets as a foundation and a backup, but they were the first grade levels that we could um, really begin to leverage the learning management system because we do have a one-to-one -one ratio in those grade levels. And then moving on grade six to 12, as you're aware, we are also are in a one-to-one -one device ratio. And those students, in fact, take those devices back and forth day in and day out. In terms of the resource requirements, we knew that we needed to design a learning plan that would support students receiving specialized services. Rather, those specialized services are because of special education needs or um, English learner needs or uh, giftedness or um, students experiencing homelessness and that um, our framework needed to accommodate um, the levels of developmental readiness. You know, there's a wide range of capacity between preschool and our three and four year old programs all the way up to our 18 year olds in 12th grade. And then to provide for both digital and non-digital access as uh, I mentioned earlier. And then ultimately to provide for flexibility because we understand that every home, every household is working through this in, um, very different conditions. Uh, everyone is, if you're working from home, you're not only trying to accomplish your job, but you're also trying to educate your own children who may be in the household with you while you're taking care of the pets and all the other things that are happening in your household um, while you're trying to teach your child or teach other people's children. And so we recognize what was important here is that we design a system that was flexible for families um, so that the, we uh, were in this together for success and that it was anchored in this understanding of compassion that everyone is under a great deal of stress and challenge right now and that while we need to make progress for our students we also need to um, contextualize the conditions that people are working in okay thank you if i could go on to the next slide I think this is my last slide. My team will have to let me know. Um, so continuity of learning, the logistics. I want to take just a moment here to talk a little bit about what's involved with actually standing this plan up um, besides developing the curricular resources. And a little later in the presentation, uh, Dr. Adams will be sharing with you the sort of volume, depth, and breadth of the curricular uh, work that's been involved to get us to the point that we are today. Um, but um, as discussing earlier, our assets were the fact that we do have one-to-one -one devices for our secondary students and one-to-one -one devices for our three to five. And that our learning management system does house curricular resources for students in preschool all the way through grade 12. And then that provides us a platform for interaction between our students, families, and our uh, certificated uh, personnel. And so that's to our benefit. They were resources that we had working in our favor. Some of the constraints or challenges we face is that our devices in grades three to five 
because students do not take them home every day, um, the charging cords were um, integrated into the charging carts. And so to um, separate the charging cords from the charging cart um, was an extensive process that involved uh, manpower and time uh, because of cord management. Uh, you couldn't just pull that charging cord out. It had to be done in a process uh, for the DOIT team which thank you, Mr. Corns, they did a great job over time for us. Um, and that these um, three to five devices were not able to be deployed or sent home with students on the initial closure on March 13th. Um, the other challenges that we face, as mentioned, is that not all families have internet connectivity at their homes for whatever reason. It may be by choice, it may be because their home is in a remote location, um, and it may just be that they financially are not able to um, have that benefit. And then uh, the distribution process need to be established to be able to get our three to five devices to families. We need to be able to identify how to support those families that did not have connectivity um, with resources uh, to help them with connectivity in this crisis. And then ultimately um, the logistics around trying to provide print form um, packets for families that needed that support as well. So there's quite a lot of logistics in the physical aspect of setting up our continuity of learning plan. If I could go on to the next slide. Good morning, this is Mrs. Shea. Dr. McComb is okay if I jump in? Yes, thank you, Megan. Sure, so good morning, everyone. Um, so as Dr. McComas said, we obviously had a lot of logistics to think through um, to prepare our students, but we also wanted to make sure that we thought through how would we best prepare our teachers and our administrators um, for working in this new environment. As you all know, and I, I um, heard from all of your comments last night on the board meeting that you're very, very in tune to what a challenge this was um, for everyone involved. But we knew that it was critically important that we prepare our teachers um, as best we could through professional learning. So as Dr. McComas indicated, um, while schools um, reopened on March 30th, we had prepared enough um, practice work for students through April 3rd, which gave us the opportunity to use the week of March 30th through April 3rd for some robust professional learning for our teachers and for our administrators so that we could give them that week to prepare um, for what they would need to do um, in order to lead this work. And so we began by developing a course in our learning management system. Um, we titled that course, the BCPS School-Based Remote Learning Professional Learning Course. And the goal for developing this course was to include all of the professional learning content in one place to try to make it easier for us to reach uh, 10,000 teachers and administrators um, from afar. And so to make that even more um, straightforward, we actually, um, in collaboration with the Blended Teaching and Learning team, created 178 sections of this course so that there was an individual course for each school. Um, I want to also take this opportunity to um, talk about a rising star in our school system. Um, our e-learning team has been absolutely invaluable during this time. Um, we are actually having an opportunity to peek into their world where they have developed expertise because this is the format in which they teach students um, year round. So they have been an incredible asset to my team in academics and to everyone really in the system in helping us to develop professional learning um, um, around how to best use this environment to meet the needs of students. It's really important that everyone understand that this is not just a matter of assigning homework. Teaching in a remote learning environment is a different skill set, and so part of the professional learning was to help teachers immerse themselves in that environment first as learners so that they could understand what that experience would feel like for students because having that perspective then helps them to see how to best prepare their own lessons. So to that end, when we developed the professional learning, we developed a combination of what we called asynchronous lessons, which essentially means they were self-paced. So we had recorded PowerPoints or recorded videos um, to walk teachers and administrators through content that we wanted them to learn, but it was posted in a way that teachers could do it on their own pace and at their own schedule. We know that during this critical time, that's a really important element. When we talk all the time about trying to center mental health and wellness 
wellness, and I heard many of you talk about that last night as well. Um, it's really important that we understand that um, teachers are now taking care of um, children. They are, in some instances, homeschooling themselves or taking care of um, adults or other family members who may, um, in fact, become sick. So we wanted to be sure that the content was able to be worked through in a meaningful way um, and also to give teachers an opportunity to re-watch. Um, sometimes we need to hear things more than once. At the same time, we know how critical that live interaction and connection can be when learning something new. And so we also wanted our teachers to have an opportunity to participate in uh, live sessions, although they were virtual. So we still were following the adherence to the governor's executive order, um, but we conducted um, live sessions and interactive sessions with groups of teachers to provide coaching. So for example, we met with department chairs or reading specialists um, or school-based math teachers. Um, we also wanted to make sure that um, we developed a pathway that was compatible for both teachers and administrators. Um, it's important to note that our administrators have their own challenges because leading in this environment is also um, very different. And many of us who work in central office that are in a position to coach and support leaders are coaching and supporting principals to lead an environment that none of us led in. So we wanted to make sure that we developed compatible pathways for professional learning and honored the space that all of us are learning um, in this new environment. And so there were um, professional learning opportunities for classroom teachers, for support personnel, um, counselors, speech pathologists, special educators, um, principals, assistant principals, everyone in the organization had an opportunity um, to participate in professional learning. Mr. Corns, if you could go to the next slide. Um, I wanted to walk through, we um, had several different topics and we built out the week of professional learning to make sure that we thought about what would be those foundational skills of uh, teaching and learning in a remote environment that we knew we needed um, all of our teachers and administrators to understand. So we started with just this idea of how to transition to remote learning. Some of the things to think about in terms of how to set up your course in a way that makes sense, how to think about about developing opportunities for that interactive discussion in a remote environment. We also wanted to make sure that we reviewed some of the functionality of Schoology. We are very fortunate that when this crisis hit, we had such a robust learning management system that um, included tools and functionality to allow us to leverage this space um, in a way that maybe um, we would not have had had we not transitioned to Schoology. And so it was important for us to make sure that if there were features or functionality that teachers had not necessarily used in the classroom, that given the challenge challenges faced in the remote learning environment that they were made aware of that functionality and had an opportunity to practice it. This was especially important for some of our primary teachers because as Dr. McComas said, um, they don't have a device ratio of one to one. So they often used Schoology as more of a um, place to store resources, but not necessarily as an interactive tool. So it was important that they had an opportunity to learn some of that functionality. We also um, planned professional learning on how to use um, different tools for hosting virtual class meetings. As we said before, just like it was critically important that we had a combination of asynchronous and live um, opportunities for teachers, we knew moving forward as part of our continuity of learning plan, we would also want to provide those really, really important opportunities for our students to have that face-to-face uh, -face interaction both with their teacher um, but also with each other and so to do that we identified platforms um, including Google Meets and Microsoft Teams and provided some rich um, professional learning for teachers and administrators on the functionality of these um, tools so that they would be in a position to host these live interactive opportunities with students. Later on in the week, we then, so we spent the beginning half of the week just priming the pump and preparing everyone for what is this going to mean to teach in this remote learning environment. In the second half of the week, we got into more of the details. So we developed a lesson to teach teachers about all of the resources um, that the academics offices would be providing. And I know Dr. Adams later is going to talk um, in more detail about what exactly we've been providing. We have provided and continue to provide for teachers. Um, but part of the professional development was to help 
teachers understand where do I go, where do I find it, how can I find models uh, to support that. Um, and that started really with helping teachers to understand um, a revised scope and sequence of what would be the most important learning for each of those courses. And then in collaboration with the Office of um, Special Education and the Office of um, School Climate and Safety and uh, Social Emotional Learning, we also developed resources to help uh, support our students um, receiving special education services um, and also to develop content to support our related service providers. So um, there were lessons built to talk about um, managing uh, the services for students receiving special education as well as um, lots and lots of resources to support that social emotional learning both for the adults and then also for them to use to support students. This was also an opportunity to engage our related service provider partners. So all of the other student support staff that work so hard to support the needs of our students uh, when we're in the schoolhouse and how can we also help them to learn new and different ways to be able to do that critical engagement in a new way. Um, and then we ended the week by helping them, uh, helping teachers and administrators understand best practices for managing those virtual class times. So we talked about um, safety and uh, ways to ensure digital safety and um, privacy. We also talked about ways to ensure engagement to help keep students um, in a frame of mind to keep them positive and to keep them um, moving forward. So you can see that throughout that week, we developed a lot of content um, and worked really, really hard to ensure that we were giving our teachers the strongest foundation possible for making such a huge transition. Next slide, please. And so I'm gonna share this slide with Dr. Wisted. Um, so I'll sort of talk through the left-hand side of the slide and then I will um, turn it over to her to share on the right-hand slide. Um, but what I wanted to now kind of frame is, um, as you've been thinking about some of that professional learning and some of what Dr. McComas described as some of the parameters that we were working with, um, we wanted to sort of outline what are the instructional expectations that teachers have been given during this continuity of learning um, time. So the expectation that we have for teachers is that there is a combination, just like we had that combination for uh, professional learning, that we have a comb combination of asynchronous instruction. And again, by asynchronous, I mean um, self-paced instruction using our learning management system, as well as opportunities for that live face-to-face -face interaction. So the first bullet, when we talk about asynchronous instruction using our learning management system, our expectation is that teachers are posting the new lessons um, at the beginning of the week and that students have the opportunity to work through those lessons at a pace that makes sense for them and for the different challenges in their family um, and that those assignments are then submitted by the end of the week. The decision to have that type of instruction be asynchronous was really done with the intention of centering uh, the mental and emotional health of our students and their families. This, as we've all mentioned, is an incredibly stressful time. We know that many of our students are experiencing um, newfound levels of um, stress in this environment. They may have unpredictable home environments. Um, from everything as significant as experiencing homelessness due to job loss um, or to just juggling uh, time and space to share. In my own home, um, I've often talked about we currently in my home have an elementary school, a middle school, and a high school, as well as um, two offices running all out of our um, home. And so sometimes that asynchronous instruction allows me as a parent to support each of my children in a different way at a different time. Um, and I know that as a mom, if all of that had was happening at the same time, that would make it that much more challenging. So the asynchronous instruction expectation is that each week teachers are posting new lessons um, and the lessons include direct instruction either through recorded videos, um, annotated examples, anchor charts, um, that type of thing. Um, and then throughout the week, there are opportunities for that live interaction. So it is expected that every teacher hosts a class meeting each week. 
Um, we began with the expectation for that class meeting, again, centering that social emotional wellness um, to be just that check-in, that opportunity to reestablish that community of learning that our students and our teachers have been missing so, so much during this time. Um, but moving forward, those class meetings are also an opportunity for them to discuss some of the lessons that have been posted, answer any questions, um, perhaps create an opportunity for students to share what they've been working on in the same way that we might um, in the school setting. Um, and then the third expectation that was established for teachers is this idea of office hours. Now, it's really important just to clarify, it's not that we're expecting that teachers are um, chained to a chair, um, nor are we expecting that, um, as you can see, there's much more work that they're doing throughout the day. But what we wanted to be forward facing about is for parents and students to really understand when can I have some expectation that I'll be able to reach my teacher. Um, and so by posting office hours, teachers are communicating to students and their families when they will be online and available. So in some instances, I've I know some teachers have um, office hours where kids can pop into a Google Meet and just have that opportunity to ask a quick question or to get clarification. In other cases, those office hours are an opportunity for parents to know that their email will be read and that they'll have an opportunity to get a response. Um, and in some cases, office hours, I know Dr. Wistad's going to talk about some of the related service providers, but in some instances, that's a time they're making phone calls um, to check in with families. So through those three main instructional expectations, um, hopefully you've been able to understand a little bit more about our um, continuity of learning plan. And so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Wisted to now talk about that additional layer of specialized instruction uh, for students receiving special services. Good morning. Um, yes, so I have the next few slides, which I'll go through in a little more detail about special education, advanced academics, and ESOL, and how we are serving um, those populations of children um, and with special education, I just wanted to share that, um, and actually with all three, if it wasn't me, it was other staff members that were participating with MSDE and their guidance. They, you know, they've been pushing out guidance and holding meetings um, for the, spe the specific groups, such as special education, advanced academic, and East also, you know, we're getting guidance from the state and um, through special education, I've been participating in daily communication with the other directors of special education who are in the LEAs around Maryland, just so that um, you know we're collaborating with each other, we're understanding. We, we've participated in national webinars that are happening um, as well, so that we know that we are serving the children as best as we can within um, you know this circumstance. We can go to the next slide. Um, for special education specifically, um, as I shared, you know, we've been participating in these sessions and what's really important to know, because I know I've been teaching you throughout the year um, about IDEA, our Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, and to provide a free and appropriate public education to all students, um, special education then we, we need to mirror whatever's happening with general education. So the continuity of instruction that we are offering for general ed students, we looked at that and we've been guiding special educators um, and their IEP chairs to create um, a plan. So there's an amendment to the IEP. It's a form that schools are already familiar with. You do not have to have an IEP team to make an amendment to an IEP. So we asked every school to contact each parent and share what that amendment would look like. So now what does the continuity of instruction, what does the individualized education program now look like for each individual child? For example, if they typically had five pull-out sessions a week for Art and Gillingham, as an example, now that general ed instruction is reduced drastically, um, they maybe are only getting two pullout sessions of Orton -Gill Gillingham instruction. Um, same with related services. If they would typically get three sessions a week, maybe they are only getting one session a week. So we ask teachers uh, to collaborate, the special educator to collaborate with the general educator as well as the related service provider 
like they would do that week before school started, make their schedule for the week. Um, I'm getting a message. Can people still hear me? Saying poor quality? Yeah. You, uh, you can, can still hear, hear me? You. Yeah, I can okay, hear you. Okay, great. I can hear you. All right, I'll ignore that. Um, so we ask them to you know, create what their plan, their schedule is going to look like, because obviously it's going to look a lot different um, than it did in live instruction. And then they were to call every family, share what the amendment would be, um, and then if the parent had the ability to have it emailed to them, that you know would be preferred. Um, and because obviously we can't mail anything to anyone. Um, school teams should be continuing to hold IEP teams as scheduled if possible. So for example, if there was an annual review that was coming up and they had all the information for the IEP to be updated, they could still hold that session. Um, again, they could do it by phone call with the parent. They could do Google Meet. Um, I believe that was explained earlier as that's our recommendation. Um, and so they could still hold that meeting. If for some reason they could not hold it because they did not have the information. For example, they were reviewing assessments. They would not be able to necessarily have all the assessments completed if they hadn't already had the face-to-face -face, um, set formal assessment session with the student if they already had that information and it was just a matter of finishing writing up the report sharing that with the family they could still have that IEP. Um, we were recommending weekly contact with the parent so either the special educator the related service provider or the IEP chair um, would be contacting the parent regularly and then the important part is we know that there is going to be an impact from students based on this extended closure and the services they are receiving. When we return, whenever that is, um, the recommendation will be for every school to hold an IEP team for each child. Obviously, it's not going to happen that first week. We are back. You know, we're, we'll have a grace period of when these meetings would be held because we have to determine the impact of um, the closure and, and how the services were delivered. So at that time, we would look at, you know, was there a regression for the child? Was, <clears throat> were the sessions that we offered enough and there was no impact? Therefore, their IEP will remain the same and their services will remain the same. If there is an impact, does that mean we now need to increase services for student, certain students or we need to add goals and objectives because there's new things they're going to be working on based on the impact of this time that we've been closed? Maybe there is uh, compensatory services that we need to offer to make up for the impact that has happened um, and, and maybe the gap has widened. One thing we've been sharing with school staff is that um, compensatory services in this case is very different than how people feel about compensatory service. Typically, you know, it, it's schools look at that like they've done something wrong and now I owe compensatory service. I've neglected do a particular thing and we've been very clear with them that um, the guidance that's coming nationally to us as well as through MSDE is it is not the fault of the school system so it is not a denial of faith a free and appropriate public education because it's not our fault that schools are closed so if we are giving compensatory services when we return um, it's not because we have done something wrong. So we've really tried to put schools at ease about, um, you know, speaking with parents and keeping positive relationships with families as we navigate through these times um, to ensure that services for all students would be appropriate. We can go on to the next slide. Um, so to give some examples for services that are typically provided through inclusion, recommendations that we've given um, to schools is supporting the general educator as they would during the school year. So that might be differentiating materials, providing supplementary materials for them, and collaborating with the general educator for any other support. Um, it may also look like providing parallel lessons or small group instruction, as I was saying earlier. Um, they could do that recorded and push that out or it could be face-to-face -face live instructional lessons um, that they are doing with students. We can go on to our next slide. Um, 
for students that typically are provided services outside of general education, so that could be special education services or related services such as speech, OT, PT, uh, we are recommending that they do recorded or face-to-face -face video instruction one to two a week. Um, and then also an additional um, supplemental intervention related work that they can provide to the students that could be recorded and pushed out. Um, we are giving recommendations because as you know, we have special populations of students that are not working on a diploma, but are receiving an alternate um, curriculum. And for students in our FALS CALS, as uh, Dr. McComas was saying earlier, you know, we have packets for them, but we are also recommending doing some live sessions um, with those students. And again, making them only like 15 or 20 minutes, knowing that, you know, they can't sit for a long um, period of time. So, you know, we are trying to be flexible and when we keep saying that to people, you know, be as flexible as possible, you know your students, um, you know, and create sessions that work for the students and the family. For um, advanced academics, um, our Office of Advanced Academics has been working very closely with our academics content areas. They have created um, the lessons on the same uh, cycle as Ms. Shea was explaining earlier for advanced Excuse four. Excuse me a minute, Melissa. Could uh, Jim, could you go to the next slide? Oh, sorry, thank you. Um, so they have created um, materials for advanced four mathematics, the middle and high school um, GT English language arts, middle and high school GT science. Um, and then for the next round, we are in development for enrichment menus for K to five to mirror the print um, pathway that's happening as well as uh, differentiated digital content for grades three through five. Um, and then there'll be continued ongoing work in the advanced four um, and secondary GT courses um, for the future weeks if we need to continue to do that. We can move on to our next slide to talk about ESOL. Um, they uh, as well for you may remember when we've done our ESOL um, sessions before at the um, Secondary level, there are actual courses that students are in. Um, and at the elementary level, it's a cluster model where support um, through the ESOL teacher is uh, delivered for different students. So for elementary, they did online sample lessons, newcomer elementary grades one through five. And for kindergarten and middle school, they did the specific ESOL one, two, three, and literacy for English learners. At the high school level, they um, provided materials for the newcomer, ESOL 1, 2, 3, 4, American Culture, and ESOL Math. They are also creating the TV lessons for elementary newcomer and secondary newcomer, and the co-teaching supports which are in place um, are that the ESOL teacher will continue to collaborate with the classroom teacher and push in um, during instruction and be able to provide accommodations and modifications as they would typically in the live session. Let's go to the next slide. Our uh, Office of ESOL also did a multiple communication and support activities. Um, they've been collaborating with the communications department and translating all of the communications that have been coming out into the eight most popular languages. Um, and they updated parts of the website um, in the different languages as well. They collaborated with Innovative Learning. Um, again, those support documents for parents, um, they translated those and helped to work through those so that they could access PCP, PCPS1, Schoology, and Google Meets. Um, so you can see some samples that are there, how to communicate with your teacher or school is in eight different languages, how to communicate with families who speak limited English. Um, they have voicemail lines for Spanish, Chinese, Russia, and Urdu. Um, all of the FAQs 
they've translated into the eight most popular language and then they um, have done ongoing training to support the video remote interpreting. So um, you may recall through the contract process, I believe we taught you about our language line. And so that is active and well um, for all of the schools to continue using families and remember the language line and uses all of the different um, languages, not just the most popular ones. So schools are continuing to access that. Okay, you can go on to the next slide, which I think is Renard. Uh, good morning, curriculum committee members. Um, we wanted to take an opportunity to talk to you about the scope and magnitude of what we've done and what we are um, operationalizing at the moment. As you know, we have almost 100 and 16,000 students that we're trying to reach. And for context, that's more than twice the number of students in Howard County Public Schools. And in fact, in Baltimore County, we have more students living in poverty than Howard County has in their total school population. Um, Ms. Shea talked about reaching um, 10,000 people between our 90, 600 teachers and our over 400 administrators, our principals and assistant principals. I wanted to also add that we also, in working with Dr. Zarchin and Dr. Nieves' team, have been reaching out to all of the related service and support personnel, such as the PPWs, the school psychologists, the social workers, the speech and language therapists, and, and so, on, so on and so forth. So we knew we had to reach all of these people. We knew we had to do a, a massive amount of work, and we've, I think, done a really nice job. I couldn't be prouder. In terms of the instructional resources that we have provided to our staff, um, Ms. Shea and the academics team did a yeoman's job. They, it was really outstanding and extraordinary. Over 445 courses have revised scopes and sequences for the remainder of the year. What the academic offices did was they identified the most critical standards for students to learn between now and June and chunked that into um, two standards each week and we are creating and have created over 1,300 digital lessons and print resources aligned with those standards that are provided both to teachers um, through Schoology and um, through the print packets that are available on the website. Um, Ms. Shea talked about the professional learning courses, the 178. Uh, you may be wondering why there are more professional learning courses than there are schools. Uh, that is because we also created professional learning courses for central office staff and related service staff. So the entire division of curriculum and instruction had a professional learning course, just as we set up for schools. Um, the division of school safety and climate had their own professional learning course so that they could work through those options with their staff as well. Uh, there were 13 professional learning self-paced sessions that were created. Um, again, we're trying to, um, as you know, Dr. Williams is a strong believer in the power of professional learning. And we saw this um, week, the third week of the initial closure as our opportunity to basically reopen the school system. And so we treated it like a pre-service week. Um, under Dr. McComas's direction, she also asked us to think about how we might leverage our TV station and BCBS TV. So at the moment, we have 16 instructional videos that have been created and will be broadcast on a rotating basis on BCBS TV for our families that have access to that. Um, we are, Dr. McComas spoke about our print pathway for our students preschool to grade five. So we are um, mass printing and mailing over 57,000 print packets to cover the first, the next three weeks of instruction. And then at the secondary level, where we're leveraging Schoology, our learning management system, so the primary um, way of instruction and engagement is through the device, but we know we have students who unfortunately didn't come to school that last day, so they didn't have the opportunity to take their device home, or they don't have internet access at home. And so what we've done is we've created a link on the public site that um, enables a secondary student, a secondary parent or guardian, or a teacher to request course packets on behalf of the student. And because secondary students have individualized schedules, um, each of those requests allows them to select among the 445 courses which courses are aligned to their schedule and then those are being printed in our copy and print shop and mailed as of 6 p.m last night 
we had almost 1,500 requests for secondary packets, and I know that number is larger as of this morning. And then, of course, we know we have our almost 69,000 devices um, that we are leveraging, and that includes all of our devices in grades 6 through 12, and we've had, um, we sent out a survey to our families of third, fourth, and fifth graders asking who would require a device um, in the home. We know some families have multiple devices in the home, and we know some families have no devices in the home. And so this 68891 number includes an elementary request um, in grades three to five of 10,000 devices that are in the process of being, um, we're waiting for all of the boxes so that we may ship them home to the families of those parents. Jim, can I have the next slide, please? Um, we wanted to talk a little bit about attendance. Um, follow the state, as um, Ms. Dr. Wisted mentioned, the State Department of Maryland is convening lots of local, all of the local school systems around a variety of topics. One of them is attendance and how we are um, staying engaged with students. Since um, instruction is asynchronous and students aren't in buildings every day, we can't take attendance in the typical ways that we would, which would be daily attendance at the elementary level and then period or course level attendance in middle school and high school. So what we're doing instead is we are monitoring student engagement in three different ways. Um, one, teachers can see that students are engaged by taking attendance during their weekly class meetings. Teachers can also um, monitor attendance through a student's submission of work. And then Schoology allows an analytics, Schoology has, excuse me, an analytics module that allows you to see when students have last logged on and what content they've touched. So um, using the combination of those three different aspects, teachers are monitoring student engagement and then we still have at each school attendance and engagement procedures and committees that are tracking which students, um, the students with whom we don't have any current engagement. And then we will be um, using our regular resources, whether that's the school attendance committee, the PPW or the social worker to try to do that extra step of reaching out to see what those students and those families may need in order to um, um, start their engagement with us. Because we know we don't want to lose students in this digital way because we don't have that face-to-face -face opportunity on a daily basis. Uh, Jim, can I have the next slide? So we've had lots, as you might imagine, lots of emails, and I'm sure you've received emails too from parents and students around grading and reporting. Um, as you know, the initial closure happened towards the end of marking period three and has now um, blended over into the beginning of marking period four. And so our systemic um, response to that is we are going to combine marking periods three and four into a single marking period because we don't want to disadvantage any student. At the individual assignment levels, students may receive a score for an assignment, so seven out of 10, eight out of 10, nine out of 10, or they may receive written feedback from teachers. And this will be done in Schoology through email or through teacher's office hours. And then for grading, um, following what most school systems appear to be doing across the state, students for marking period three and four will be graded as either pass or fail. There won't be a traditional letter grade of A, B, C, D, or E. And then in terms of final grades, um, there is a grading and reporting committee at the state level that is working through that because we know this will have excuse me, impact on our high school students and all of our students. And so that information has not yet been finalized, but it's forthcoming. And we know that students and parents are very eager to understand that. Jim, can we have the next slide? And I believe this is Mr. Embriali. Oh, no, this was, I can do this one. Um, and so um, we are also under the leadership of Dr. Doctors Williams and McComas thinking about what would it look like if we re-enter school? And what does that look like if we re-enter this spring before the end of the school year in June, or if we re-enter in the fall in August and September? And so if we were to re-enter um, in the spring, we have a, the revised scope and sequence, which puts all students on the same pace across the school system. That will be our foundation and our roadmap to align to completing the regular school year in a face-to-face -face manner. Um, in terms of if we reopen in the fall, we will provide guidance to our teachers and, and our principals around how they can create a review 
of prerequisite learning and materials while students are then being instructed in their new courses and their new grade levels. Can I have the next slide, Jim? And I believe this one is Mr. Imbarali's. Hi, good morning, everyone, again. So uh, you heard all the work that is ongoing to get us to the place that we're at right now with our continuity of learning and our remote instruction. But at the same time, we are focused on what lies ahead for us, like uh, um, Dr. Adams was talking about in terms of sort of this uh, re-entry phase. And so part of that is uh, looking at and reviewing and getting a handle on what summer learning will look like this summer. Uh, we do uh, have two different paths that we're looking at. One would be um, an in-person summer program, uh, and that program would in essence look a lot like what we had been planning for over the course of the last uh, six to seven months. Uh, obviously, there would be an increased priority on preventing widening of the gaps in learning and addressing uh, what that reentry phase would look like in the fall, as well as there would be a focus on high school level courses for seniors who are attempting to graduate uh, in August of 2020. We are also, of course, um, re-looking at our summer learning program and trying to understand what remote learning would look like um, in our summer programs and trying to determine exactly which aspects of our summer program we would be able to implement over the course of the summer if we were doing a virtual program. And those meetings are ongoing. A matter of fact, uh, we have meetings even today with our functional managers who are a part of that process to make determinations and recommendations up to the superintendent for what lies ahead. Uh, Jim, next slide. And Mary, I think we're turning this back over to you, if that's correct. Yes, thank you, everyone. Um, and thank you, committee members, for hanging in there. I know it took us a few minutes to get up and moving. I just, before we get into questions, I just want to take a moment to um, call attention to our time. It's currently 10.04, according to uh, my laptop um, clock. And our committee runs until 10.30, and we do have uh, numerous um, instructional materials that we'd like to review with the committee and have you uh, vote on uh, because they are resources that will be upcoming in the April contract committee. So on that, if I could open up the floor for questions and if we could hold the questions to uh, wrap up by 1010, that would give us 20 minutes to get through the rest of the agenda. So thank you. Let me uh, jump in if I may. First, I want to thank all of you for this very extensive work for anyone who thought that this would be uh, simple. Mm -mm 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 -mm. You certainly have put a lot of thought, uh, not just in ter terms of the curriculum, but also social emotional um, pieces to it. So thank you very much. Kudos to the e-learning team and to Mr. Korn's staff as well. Um, thank you. Um, everything was very extensive, so I'll leave it to the other members to ask those questions because I've looked over this so much, I know it in my heart. Um, I appreciate the work that you have done on re-entry, particularly um, uh, the summer um, look and what might happen well um, when we go into the fall. Mr. McMillian and I had this discussion and he mentioned it last night that this actually, um, uh, it's sad, but it certainly has given us opportunities to think about things that possibly we have not thought about in the past and it might be an opportunity for us to rethink what public education uh, really should look like. So thank you for starting that work on processing what happens when students come back, uh, processing what can happen in the summer, processing what should happen to students in the fall because they can't come back, obviously, business as usual. So with that, I would turn it over to uh, the rest of the committee for questions and comments. And again, thank you. Hi, Dr. McComas. This is Lisa Mack. Hi. Um, I had posted this meeting on my Facebook website, and um, since many people communicate with me via my cell phone, um, I have gotten a lot of questions. I'm going to try to move through them quickly, but I'd like to know, in the interest of time, is there a way that we could submit questions and have the answers posted publicly? 
Yes, if you send me the questions, then what I will do is I will work through Dr. Williams and, and determine how he wants to um, send them back or post them publicly. I'll let him know your request, uh, but I would certainly have to work through Dr. Williams. Um, but I'm very happy to take your questions in writing and uh, do my best to get them the responses back to you. Okay, I'm going to ask a few quick questions. Um, do we have plan? First of all, I just want to say thank you to every one of you. I cannot imagine um, the pressure you've been under, the challenges that you have overcome, and I just wanted to say thank you. Um, do you have plans for providing um, Wi-Fi to families who do not have Wi-Fi today? So I'm not sure if Ryan or perhaps Jim or Renard can um, address the resources that we have. Um. Hi, uh, this is this is Ryan. I we we do we did provide information um, on our website about how to access free resources. For example, I know Comcast Essentials is offering 90 days uh, free right now based on um, qualified need. So we did provide that information for uh, families and the community members to be able to access uh, to um, to be able to get that internet access if they don't have it. Um, I do know that I believe if Melissa is on the call, I do know that there is work um, with uh, our um, Title I office on looking at options as well to support students. Yes, hi, I am. Um, so a few different things. Uh, Michelle Stansbury and her team have been collaborating with the other offices and um, they're looking at one layer is providing hotspots for students experiencing homelessness. Um, and so that is something that is happening through the Office of Title I. Um, they also are sharing those resources that um, Ryan talked about to all of the Title I schools to ensure that every family has access. They're looking at uh, a second layer if we are in an extended closure, uh, you know, for say the remainder of the year or whatever it turns out to be, they're looking at another layer where they could possibly provide hot spots to families in need and Title I schools and then collaborating with another office if we could find another grant to provide to families who are not in Title I schools, um, we would be able to do that for all families. Thank you very much. Um, my Ms. Mack, let me uh, jump in. Last night when I spoke about CARES, um, based on the conversation with Senators Cardin and uh, Van Hollen, um, and asking that we push for the state to ask for those additional funds, um, a lot of that it will go towards trying to make sure that uh, not only hotspots, but that things are done to, to open up uh, the capabilities for students who don't have it because um, there are a lot of counties, for example, in the state of Maryland, where they have difficulty having nothing to do with economics but just having to do with where they are located um, in terms of getting this. So um, uh, Senators Van Hollen and Cardin um, have made sure that some of those monies, and whoever, I think it was Dr. Wistead who just spoke, um, that they are really looking into this. And so we'll talk about that um, later, but there are federal monies out there that the state can get to try to help this situation. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Ms. Pestier. Um, also, I, you went um, provided a lot of information about what's actually out there. And I, this is a very simple question and you may have answered it, but are we actually right now beginning to teach anything new? Are teachers being given directions that they can go to the next thing or they can go ahead if they're meeting with their classes and they see that they have, um, you know, learned what they need to learn? Do, they, do teachers have the autonomy, autonomy to move ahead? So, Megan, if you would go ahead and address that and maybe explain the scope and sequence and the learning objectives. Yes, absolutely. Um, good morning, Ms. Mack. 
So um, in the professional learning that we just described, one of the um, activities we had teachers do was to go and see the scope and sequence that was developed. And so to develop the scope and sequence, what my team did was um, twofold. One, um, because it should be noted that the scope and sequence was done for the um, remainder of the year. Even though um, school closures have not um, yet been extended, we wanted to be prepared. And so when the team was identifying those objectives to include in the scope and sequence that they revised, they did two things. One was they looked at our current year at a glance of what was the new learning that was intended to be taught in the fourth quarter. Uh, what were those priority standards that if we didn't address would create a gap. Um, and then also to think about what would be the most critical standards for that grade level um, if this were to extend for the remainder of the school year, what would be the most critical objectives for students, say, for example, in grade three to know um, as they transition um, to grade four in the fall? With that in mind, our direction for teachers was, was because what we know is in 178 schools, our teachers' pacing is different. Um, and as it should be, teachers are being responsive to kids. Um, while we have a year at a gla glance and pacing guide, we know that sometimes teachers, based on the needs of their students, um, are able to move at either a faster or slower pace. Um, but of course, we weren't able to develop individualized scope and sequences for every school. So our recommendation to teachers is that they begin by looking at that scope and sequence that we developed, because it's important that we have some consistency across the system um, in terms of our expectation of what content we know has been addressed, but that then they look at that scope and sequence and compare it to what they know about their students and where their students are to make the best decision about what comes next. So for example, so they do have the autonomy. They have the autonomy. They also have the ability to use the lessons that we've developed um, in one of three ways. Um, where appropriate, teachers can certainly use the lessons exactly as we've developed and publish them for their students. And that would be a tremendous support. They can look at the lessons we've developed and make some modifications and then push them to students. Or they can simply use our lessons as a model and then create their own. Um, so in the instance that you talked about, if a teacher was well ahead of us, then they should use the lessons that we've developed as a support, as a sample, and then create one that would be most appropriate for their students. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have two more quick questions, and then I will be quiet. Um, what are we doing to, and I think you touched on this um, in the attendance piece, but we all know we have some highly motivated students and some less motivated students. And we were doing, when we were doing asynchronous learning, the less motivated students might continue to be less motivated. Are we doing anything to increase the time that teachers are actually spending? And I understand we, we worked in a... Um, like a crisis mode, but on a going forward basis, will we be increasing the amount of synchronous learning that takes place um, teacher-led? Is there any um, plans for that at this point? Yeah, so let me go ahead and comment on that one, Ms. Mack. So I, I want to take just a moment here and really um, dive into what are the conditions needed for consistent quality synchronous learning. Our teachers to do live time teaching with a live group of students, similar to what we are doing here. You really need to have the conditions that allow the teacher to not have distractions going on in the background. And likewise, the children would need to be in a situation in which they can block out distractions and can fully um, engage. And we know the reality is that um, very few people are working in that environment. As Ms. Shea kind of just shared about her home environment, She's got five people working through the house on lots of different things. And so um, that is one of the primary reasons we went with the asynchronous. Now, the idea of the live class meetings was to still provide that live interaction. And we certainly anticipate that in those class meetings, if a teacher is noticing through student questions and through assignments that are being submitted, that everyone's a little unclear on a particular skill or a particular concept, they certainly can use that live meeting opportunity to do a mini lesson or to provide a demonstration to help clarify for everyone what you would do in a classroom. If you're going around and you see everyone struggling with a particular thing, you say to the class, okay, everyone, eyes up here. I want to take a few minutes. I want to clarify. I want to revisit an idea because everyone's a little um, uncertain on it. So let's take a few extra minutes to clarify. Um, 
but we're not going to move to a situation where, um, at, or at least not at this point in the foreseeable future, where the expectation is teachers are teaching live lessons throughout each day with um, their students because of all the variables that are happening in the children's home as well as the professional's home. Our e-learning team does teach in a synchronous fashion, and once we do return, I'll be happy to take you over to the um, center. It's right there, Ms. Mack and Catonsville with you. Um, oh, the okay. Old, the old, um, oh, I know where Catonsville it is, 757. Right. Yes, I know where yes. it is. Yes, and so when you go in there, you're going to um, understand it's regrettable we didn't get a chance to visit prior to this experience, but um, you're going to go in and see really all the conditions that go into making that effective and successful. Um, and so I, what I would say is I certainly anticipate teachers will become more skillful in how to use class time. Um, but at this point, it's not, um, I cannot foresee at this point that we would increase that. And it's for those reasons. Thank you very much. And I do You're understand welcome. that. And then my final question, um, one of the last schools I visited on my um, school visits was made in choice. And this entire time, I, I cannot stop thinking about the students at Maiden Choice and the other schools like Maiden Choice, where the school system provides so much for those students. Um, are, we, are we in contact with those parents? Um, uh, have we provided them with resources through perhaps social services? Um, uh, and again, I know you guys have done a lot with a lot of student groups, but that just sticks in my mind. Ms. Mack, I can answer that. This is um, Melissa Wisted. Uh, they actually were the group of principals who uh, we began speaking with, like, even before that two-week closure was over, um, because they are the group that um, is first in my mind as the fact that we will not be providing them with the same type of instruction um, as compared to other students. So we've been working with those principals. Um, I talk to them weekly, if not more than once a week, um, as we plan. Um, and we talked about different uh, instructional strategies that the teachers could push out. They are getting the packets. We are working through right now um, a possible device distribution if, again, we go into an extended closure for that population of students. But the main thing that the principals were sharing was that uh, the parents would appreciate their contact on staff. So that's I'm really sorry, you're the, breaking up. Okay, never mind. You just came back. The regular contact staff that we believe the families um, would want, and as I was saying before, or about the amendments, the IEPs, you know, those teachers are determining how many times a week we're contacting the families, um, you know, and providing any live instruction if that is, um, you know, even appropriate. And um, so right now the, the principals and those school staff believe that, you know, they're doing the best that they can. Of course they are, right. That's there, but we also had talked about if we are live um, this summer that, you know, as a compensatory measure, we could extend their, what we call extended school year, which is a summer program for students with IEPs. And, you know, they could have a full day program rather than a half day program. We could examine if it should be a six or an eight week program rather than a Four week program, and that could be this summer and next summer. You know, we could, um, where we've talked about a lot of options, knowing that that is the group that probably will be impacted the most based on the closure. Okay, thank you very much. And I'm sorry to use more time. Um, I'm finished. All right, That's it's okay. 10 yeah. Are there any other members who have any questions? I do. Go ahead, Mr. I'm curious. There's going to be teachers and students who thrive in this remote learning style. And I'm curious if we're planning ahead to expand e-learning if and when we come back to give these teachers and students the opportunity 
to continue with this if they want to. There might be kids that are thriving in this that that were just marginalized in a traditional classroom back in a corner someplace. But in this setting, they, they love it. Are we going to allow them to continue with this if – if they've shown that they can handle it and they're successful with it? So I think, Mr. McMillian, you raise a great question because I think you're right. You know, different students thrive in different conditions. And our traditional schoolhouse is not always the setting that all students thrive in. I, I know my um, brother in particular was a student who was uh, the traditional school setting was not for him. And yet he turned out to be a very successful entrepreneur. So I would agree with you. At this point, I'm actually going to ask Mr. Embriali to take a moment to just talk about what is our e-learning program and, and how students access that. I, I cannot in the moment, Mr. McMillian, promise you that we would, um, you know, double or quadruple our e-learning offerings. But I agree with you that this whole experience will alter the face of public education, as you said last night, um, moving forward in ways that I think it's difficult for us to entirely foresee. Hi, so good, good morning again. Mr. McMillian, our uh, e-learning program has continued to grow each year. Uh, we service uh, close to 3,000 students over the course of a school year, and many of those students come in and um, in and then exit the program for various reasons. They could be assigned to e-learning through um, the, the designee process. Uh, they could be assigned through e-learning through home and hospital because of particular needs that they might have where they can't be in the regular day school. Or uh, they could be students who for whatever reason are out of the area or the country for an extended period of time and are continuing their services through Baltimore County through our e-learning program. C currently e-learning uh, the way it's set up uh, can't issue a diploma uh, based on the the credits that are needed to to that you're needed to obtain. Now that's something that we're continuing to look at and review. So there's always that option. Uh, E-learning is um, it's uh, it's it's quite a, a robust program, and we have a number of teachers who that is their full time job. They they work in that program. Jim Fazino, who's the supervisor of e-learning, um, uh, is an excellent resource as we as we were moving into this remote remote learning plan, as uh, Miss Shea had mentioned, um, and that team. Uh, does amazing work on a regular basis. I, I think there's always an opportunity to consider how we would expand services like that. Uh, that um, that has uh, obviously budgetary uh, implications, um, and we would have to work with the State Department of Education to ensure that we would be able to um, have a full uh, school, if you would say, where you'd be able to issue a diploma when a student completes the work. Okay, and I want to make the point, too, about the, the teachers. You know, nationwide, we're in a teacher crisis with retention and recruitment. There might be, out of our 9,600 teachers, there might be some teachers that love this, that, that have never been exposed to it other than the traditional classroom. So th this might be an, a, a breath of life as far as their careers are concerned. Some of them might just want to go do this and, and get out of the traditional classroom. Are we thinking ahead about, about you know, the, just not the students, but the teachers too? Right. So I think, Mr. McMillian, you're, you're spot on in that the, uh, the, the educator workforce, certainly, especially our younger generation of teachers, are so much more digital native. And um, I, I foresee in the long haul, um, as we were saying, public education transforming to some degree. And I think over time there will be expansion of that, which would, of course, also create um, the need for teachers to, to provide uh, synchronous instruction. I, I think what I have experienced is that that takes time and it takes uh, a certain political will of the community and political agreement if you think about just the a journey that we have been on as a school community around digital resources, digital instruction, to what degree are people confident in it, to what degree are people unsure and and um, hesitant about it. I think it's a 
it's a journey um, to answer your question. And certainly as we expand programs, however quickly or however slowly that may be, that too would increase the need for teachers. I think um, right now, as we know from the budget, um, the CE's budget yesterday, we would be hard pressed to expand the number of e-learning positions right now, given that um, classroom enrollment in the physical buildings uh, continue to grow um, at large rates. And so I think it's a process to answer your question, but I do agree entirely with you that this entire pandemic will, to, to a large degree, have long lasting impact on our thinking and our processes for public education. And, and my last question, can somebody just talk, give me a, a brief look at what does physical education look like during this remote learning? So we just actually in the fall brought to the curriculum committee um, the course proposal that, and I know Ryan can speak more to that because we're in a pilot this year, if I recall correctly. Uh, we are in a pilot in our um, in our actual e-learning program, Mr. Mamillion. So we do we do actually offer a virtual e-learning physical education course. Uh, that course has um, a lot of expectations around monitoring fitness levels. Um, in that particular class, the e-learning one, students are actually issued um, bands where they can like track their heart rate track their physical activity, which is then connected back to the to the physical education teacher. Here, with remote learning with our 115,000 students with physical education, that obviously has, that obviously looks quite a bit different. I can simply speak to what it looks like for my third grader and my sixth grader, um, and they both are expected to do physical activity and record that physical activity and report on it. Yes, and if I can jump in, this is Mrs. Shea. So in the same way, our PE office has also developed uh, resources for both the print and digital pathways. Um, and so they do include um, menu approaches where there are um, calendar approaches of different recommendations for um, physical activity, logs for students to keep, uh, teachers post uh, sample videos, including circuits, um, that they record for kids to do, and then um, students log in and complete that. Um, and there are still assignments um, that are reflective of the standards in um, physical education. So they're still they're still doing it just like everybody else. It's just obviously modified. Thank you. Thank you very much for answering all my questions. Thank you. My Anyone else? Uh, Mr. Offerman here. Uh, this is more of a suggestion or a, a, probably a long-term suggestion. It seems to me that we would miss a real opportunity if we didn't find some way to get uh, systematic feedback of how this whole situation has occurred and during the entire process, sort of at the end of the process. I think we could learn a lot from that. And I also think that uh, we hope, of course, th 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 this kind of thing never, uh, never happens again, but it, it would give us you know, maybe perhaps some uh, some 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 real some real insights into uh, into different ways to uh, to teach kids that that we uh, we haven't done before. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Opperman. Oh, I didn't mean to cut you off, but um, thank you for that point. And um, and I have made note of that. We uh, just to let you know, we have been um, actively trying to reflect on our uh, process as we go and like learn you know, um, learn each step of the way because this is uh, pathfinding. Um, I was saying to one of our principals, it's a little bit, I said we were, that long list of things that Dr. Adams shared, um, much of that occurred within 10 to 15 business days. And so it's a little bit like one of those extreme home makeovers, you know, you have 30 days to completely redesign the entire public school system and, and stand it up within 10 to 15 days. Um, and so I think you're absolutely right that there is a lot to, to learn from this, and hopefully we will never um, need to do it again. Uh, I think I was joking with my team that, um, you know, they didn't have this chapter in the principal book. When I went to principal school, and I don't know about you, Ms. Pastor, they, they didn't have that chapter in principal school, you know, how to, how to transform everything in 10 days or less for a pandemic. Um, and so uh, we look forward to to learning and documenting and archiving that learning for those who come behind us. And uh, God forbid any unforeseen pandemic. 
in, in our future. So one that and I need I to take a ahead. Yes, ma'am. Say, uh, and, and then I'll ask Mr. Rashid if he has any closing comments that because I'm hooked, of course, I, I'm looking at a screen that is is going through the pandemic uh, pandemic in this country, and so many questions are popping up from different states about the things about which we're speaking. So this is not just a Maryland issue by any stretch of the imagination, and so we do have to rely on our state and federal government as well as those of us in the local to offer support for all of those things about which we've spoken. Mr. Rashid, do you have any questions or comments? He's not here. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, okay. uh, Dr. McComish, you want to move forward then? We do. So thank you, everyone. I know we're technically at our committee time. If I may beg to have your attention for another um, 15, 20 minutes maximum. The next committee does start promptly at 11, so I want to make sure that we are out of the way for the um, gym team and the, the technology that will need to be in place to um, take care of that committee's um, um, digital needs. So if I may very quickly, I just to go over we have numerous instructional materials and you know i always like to um ensure that our committee has an opportunity thank you uh, for pointing the agenda back up has the opportunity to understand what are the instructional materials that are coming forward to the contracts and then ultimately the full board so that you understand the what why and how of these instructional materials and so i'm just going to very quickly identify um, what they are, and some of these I'd like to be able to move through uh, very quickly at the end, but there is, I'd like to spend a little bit more time on so that you have a, a, a really solid understanding. I think the other ones are a little more straightforward. So the first one that we will spend some time on, I'm going to ask my team if we can, um, you know, uh, move through our presentation quickly, but it's on discovery education. Discovery education is a digital resource. Um, and it has come up to uh, time to renew its contract. Um, and this is a particularly robust resource. And, and our contact right now um, really um, it points to the value of this. So, and before you advance the slide, I just want to very quickly say the one after this I want to spend some time on is a textbook. It's a broad umbrella textbook contract that I, I worry people can be confused about. And I want to make sure I spend some time with you answering your questions so you understand how that umbrella uh, contract is used. And then uh, we have some math science um, supplemental resources. I know uh, Dr. Wisted has a modification to Avid. I think you're all very familiar with Avid. That's the very last agenda item. And if need be, we may need to cut that one. But there's Avid's not new, and Avid's been well-established and approved. We just wanted to make sure that you're aware we're asking for a, a modification to the spending authority uh, coming up in April so that you weren't caught off guard by that. And I forget what the other one in there is. But at this point, I'm going to turn over to Megan and Ryan to walk us through discovery education because there's a lot of resources that um, are part of this contract. Okay, uh, Megan, do you want me to just move on to the next slide? Does that Go work? for it. Okay. Yep. <laughs> okay. So, uh, good. Um, uh, good morning again, everybody. And of course, doing this remote, Megan and I have to like like work on the fly here. Um, <laughs> I I did want to talk about the two distinct parts of the platform and service that Discovery has, and that's why um, Ms. Shea and I are doing this together. So, the the Discovery Education Experience, which used to be uh, the uh, Discovery Streaming. Um, is uh, streaming video available for um, all of our K-12 students. In Baltimore County, all students, um, actually pre-K-12, to currently have access to the streaming services. Um, the second part of the platform uh, is the tech books, and Ms. Shea will talk more about that, and they are available for specific courses in math, science, and social studies. Um, and in all content areas on both platforms, it's all research-based and aligned to educational standards. Uh, Jim, can you go to the next slide, please? So, so this um, image here is, is actually just looking into discovery education and seeing what it looks like for our students. Um, uh, a student would have our, their name there, it would be their, uh, their discovery education experience, and whatever they have access to would be available there. It, 
Dis the Discovery Education Experience Officer offers a variety of tools, um, including relevant news. Um, they do um, events programming. A matter of fact, right now on Discovery Education's uh, website, there's all sorts of information on COVID-19 and relevant programming. Uh, they also offer virtual field trips. Those field trips are live and then they're recorded so they can be viewed at, a, at another time. And then they have lots of materials that are organized by subject and standard for ease of use for both the teacher and the student. Teacher resources include content, personalized for uh, their use along with instructional tools designed to assist the teacher teacher in planning and presenting uh, lessons that utilize the resources that are part of the platform. And then the platform also houses opportunities for professional learning with step-by-step -step guides and interactive courses. So if a teacher does have questions, they can get that just-in-time learning within the platform itself. Uh, Jim, could you go to the next side, the slide, please? Uh, so, uh, the Discovery Education contains content available in all sorts of subjects. We're talking about science, social studies, arts, career skills, health, world, world languages. The assets are available and searchable by content and standards, um, and they uh, do uh, target the Maryland curriculum standards for, uh, for all of the main subject areas. Translations of materials are available in 30 languages, um, and um, the transcripts are available for almost all of the streaming programs that are provided inside of Discovery Education. Closed captioning is available and is customizable. Um, and then for the tech books, they provide interactive text to address multiple reading levels and languages. And students can highlight text, they can add sticky notes, um, they can have the text read aloud to them, and you have the ability to print the content that's inside the tech books as well. Um, there are several other tools that provide enhanced differentiation, um, such as um, uh, an item bank, um, an online um, item bank that provides uh, information for teachers in order to track sort of how the student is progressing in, the particular, um, in their particular learning within the Discovery platform. Jim, can you go to the next slide, please? So uh, Discovery Education is, gets a tremendous amount of use. It's an integral part of the curriculum for a number of the a number of our um, curriculum programs here in Baltimore County, um, and it is actually there's a number of resources that are embedded in our remote learning approach that we're using right now. Um, you can see from these quick graphs. Uh, one is demonstrating our use um, in the 1920 school year to date, which is the, the upper graph, and the lower graph is looking across um, from July 2018 through mid-February of 2020, and you can see where the dip occurs is the summertime. So you can see that the, the tool does get heavy use um, and is used by, on average, um, close to 50,000 students when we're during when we're in our months of the school year between September and um, and May uh, when you look at the month by month from July 2018 through February 2020. Um, and I believe, Megan, you're taking the next slide. I am. So thank you, Mr. Imbriali. So Mr. Imbriali just shared with you um, a lot of the information about the streaming video content. Um, I want to share with you the information about the tech books. So tech books are um, textbooks. Um, virtually, um, but they include so much more than just a digital version of a print textbook. Um, so to be more specific, um, we have them in math for all middle schools. Um, so we have access to a tech book for math six, pre-algebra and math eight, as well as for middle school algebra one. Um, not only does it include um, traditional models um, that would be included in a textbook, but it also includes videos to allow that visualization um, to move from that concrete to represent. one or two videos as well as a reading as well as a visual all in one place for students to explore that topic. Next slide. 
Um, I should mention we also have tech books for math available just in our Lighthouse High Schools. Um, that was part of the original rollout as we were first moving into uh, the use of technology in high school. For science, we have tech book access for all students K-12. to um, these resources are a critical component to our curriculum. Um, they are essentially our core text in the elementary curriculum, includes, again, those rich simulations to support that development of content, um, as well as the reading passages. So, um, and Mr. Imbriali mentioned, our reading passages um, in Discovery Techbook include accessibility features. So not only can the reading passages be translated, um, but students can also, um, teachers can shift the readability level. So when we're talking about trying to access rich uh, content vocabulary, teachers can actually adjust the reading level to meet the needs of their students. Um, and students can utilize uh, the read aloud feature to have the passage read to them. In our secondary curriculum, these resources are critical for supporting those disciplinary core ideas outlined in the Next Generation Science Standards. Um, so they have, um, they are in use in our Earth, um, Earth Systems, Living Systems, and our Physical Science courses. Um, they also provide sample strategies for teachers and assessments that teachers can use to check in um, on progress. Next slide. In social studies, um, they are the core textbook for grades six and seven, world history. Um, the, you may recall in the last uh, two years, the board has very generously supported us supplementing with print resources such as that document-based question project um, and those social studies magazines that we purchased last year. And that helps us provide a blended um, environment where students are accessing print and digital text. So the social studies tech books are used um, to provide readings. And another very important use in social studies are those primary and secondary sources. So they have curated thousands and thousands of primary source documents, images, maps, um, et cetera. In fact, the maps are so important, I listed them twice. Um, <laughs> it also <laughs> includes investigation activities for kids to be able to explore um, and try it out and allows teachers, in some cases, the investigation activities are self-checking. So imagine a drag and drop or a sort that will actually give students that feedback as well as writing practice. Next slide. Um, as we mentioned, in addition for all the benefits for students, it also provides tremendous instructional resources for teachers. So we talked about their, what they call SOS or Spotlight on Strategies. These are phenomenal strategies for engaging students in reading, discussion, and writing um, that teachers can use across content areas. I already referenced that board builder, um, which is almost like a giant virtual bulletin board where teachers can pin, if you will, uh, different resources all in one place. Um, and it provides templates for teachers for building some of those same investigations. Next slide. So the timing is actually pretty perfect that we're bringing this contract now because I cannot underscore enough, as you can, I'm sure, imagine in our current context and our continuity of learning plan, these discovery resources have been absolutely critical. Um, many of my team have talked about how they don't know how they could have done this, especially given all of the challenges and the quick turnaround, and done it in a meaningful and authentic way without this resource. We have embedded the streaming video for building background content. We have used the board builders to help organize instruction in a remote learning environment in a way that's not overwhelming for students. Um, of course, we've utilized all of the text resources and primary source documents and those interactives. All of my content teams have relied on Discovery Tech Book in one way or another. Those that have the tech books um, have used them directly, and then many of our other contents have used the streaming content to support students, um, including our ESOL office has relied pretty heavily on it in the last couple of weeks. Um, we mentioned earlier that as part of our continuity of learning, we've been developing video lessons for BCPS TV. This is a critical way to reach that population of students that we all keep talking about, those that don't have internet access, that maybe haven't been checking in, and so we've been uh, working our way with BCPS TV, and our partnership with Discovery has allowed us to also use that content on BCPS TV, which is a tremendous win um, in terms of the permissions that they've given us as really valuable partners in trying to support our students. Next slide. Okay, so I think this one's back to me. I, yep. I 
do want to make sure everyone is aware that although the product uh, discovery education has been used for over six years here in the Baltimore County Public Schools, we did go back out to RFI officially to explore new opportunities for digital content. There were 10 responses. Uh, several did not meet the criteria, the, the criteria that we set forth in the RFI. And um, after re after the re after the official review process was conducted, none were able to deliver the amount and quality of product currently offered by Discovery Education. Um, in addition, while some did offer for supports for professional learning, Discovery was able to offer through its digital platform much more accessible supports for professional development for lessons and the integration of digital content, which, as Ms. Shea talked about, is so critical right now. Right now, members of the evaluation committee agreed that Discovery Education did have the most to offer, um, and the loss of the available current content and resources would be very difficult to replace by another platform. Um, and as Ms. Shea mentioned, I did want to mention, uh, we, we work with a number of digital content providers, um, and Discovery was uh, the first to step up to the plate and offer their video services to be able to be streamed broadcast quality over BCPS television. Um, and uh, that is not something that we're seeing um, with with all of our provider, providers. And while we're in this situation, uh, that, that is a pretty significant move on the part of, um, of Discovery Education. Um, so... Uh, with that, uh, this is a contract that's coming forward. Um, oftentimes, there's questions that uh, do pertain to the cost of the product. I did just want to mention, I know the board um, is um, uh, laser focused on cost and ensuring that we're we're doing what we can to provide the services and, and do it at the best price possible. Uh, this contract is coming forward um, at a savings compared to where it was uh, previously, um, and we will continue to do that every opportunity we have. Thank you. Okay, if I may, I know um, our time is limited, so it's 1048. So uh, if we could take a few, um, just like one or two questions, and then um, I'll have Megan just very quickly touch base in the second resource, and the resources after that on the agenda, I'll work with Dr. Williams to see if there's a way I can send you the PowerPoints and perhaps for a weekly update, if he would uh, be agreeable to that or not, because I like to provide you as much information ahead of time. So uh, thank you. Hi, this is Lisa. Um, I have, I, I just am trying to understand one facet of this. Um, in the FY21 budget, across many, many um, um, subjects, there was about $16 million requested for text, T-E-X-T -E books. Yes. Is this an addendum? Yes. Is this mm -hmm. is an enhancement to them, or is this a replacement of those T-E-X-T -E books? Okay. No, so, and I'll, I'll uh, begin to address this, and Megan, if you want to jump in. So, Ms. Uh, Mack, we do already have this as part of our ongoing budget, so maintenance of effort. Um, and so this would not be replacing any of those additional requests um, that we have uh, because they serve specific things. So, for example, the Open Court is a phonics it, it program, whereas Discovery Education may have resources that can uh, supplement social studies. It's not a phonics program. Um, and so I don't know if, Megan, if you have anything else you'd like to add. Yep. So I would just um, you, add to what you already said, Dr. McComas, which is that um, anytime we're identifying the core instructional materials for any course, we try to take an approach of thinking about the best resource for that um, specific program. So this would not duplicate. In some instances, um, so for example, oh, in the yeah. 60 million request for TEXT, there was nothing included for elementary science because our recommendation is that we use the discovery textbook for elementary science. So you will not see it duplicating, but rather complementing efforts. So it, um, for example, in sixth and seventh grade, we would be using um, Discovery Textbook as our core um, in sixth and seventh grade world history, whereas the TEXT request um, in the budget was around replacing elementary math. So you can see it's really about a balance of print and digital, but it's not duplicating efforts. So just to be specific, um, under mathematics, uh, Pre-K to 12, a budget highlight was an increase of $6 million for textbooks, um, and I know that that's bridges for grades K through 5, and an increase of $1 million for Algebra 1 textbooks. Correct. So in that case, 
this is an enhancement, not a replacement. So currently we have access in our current contract that we're seeking to renew just for the middle school algebra. The request for the funds moving forward is to replace the algebra core resource for high school as well. Okay, um, okay. And then I guess my other question is, um, I had heard that the county executive cut funding for TEXT books. Yes. Um, it, are we able to cover the request for TEXT books through the um, budget allocation transfer that occurred last night? Uh, well, not the entirety as of right now. So what um, they shared last night in the budget appropriation transfer, and obviously the budget process is still unfolding, as I'm sure you saw with Dr. Williams and, and Dr. McComas, please jump in. Um, the process yeah. itself is still unfolding. We did um, understand that we will not get that funding request of the $16 million. Um, I It does not appear at this point that we're going to be able to cover the entirety of that request with that budget appropriation transfer. Our hope is to prioritize and to cover as much as we possibly can. Right, that's, and forgive me, my uh, computer paused out for a second. Um, yes, I think, you know, as, as Ms. Shea said, we will, um, once we get the actual figure in, we will, and in combination with the um, budget um, adjustment that you made last night, the bat, uh, we will look and then um, make, you know, um, decisions that uh, to make, to, to do the best we can with the resources that we have. And, and one final question. Do you, at this point in time, have any intention of not rolling out open court to the additional grades or not rolling out bridges? We have complete um, commitment to finishing the rollout for open court, and we have complete commitment to, over time, rolling out bridges. The budget um, process may require us to move to a multi-phase rollout of bridges, just as we did with open court. Uh, it is very rare to be able to get the funds to do a complete overhaul all at one time. Um, so doing a multi-year rollout, um, although not as, um, it, it slows us down, um, but it's more typical, uh, just as you saw with open court. So that is the, the direction that we'll, I think, financially need to take uh, with Bridget. Thank you both very much. My pleasure. Um, it is uh, now 10.53. Yes, so I really must uh, call our committee to an end in just a moment. So what I'm going to ask, if you, any of our other committee members that had questions on discovery, again, please feel free to email me, and I will consolidate them and get answers to you, and I'll work with Dr. Williams on what is his preferred method of sharing. I know typically he likes to uh, share, I think, through the updates so that all board members have access. Um, and then just for just a moment, Megan, if you would explain the umbrella textbook contract, because I think that can be one that's confusing to people, and my goal is to help people have good understanding. Sure. So the committee is um, likely familiar. We have talked about the concept of eSchool Mall, which is essentially um, an online platform that schools use for ease of ordering um, instructional materials. So one area within eSchool Mall are the textbooks um, and some of the supplemental texts. So in the textbook area of eSchool Mall, so I want you to imagine a shopping platform. Some of us have gotten very familiar with online shopping these days. If you think about that eSchool Mall platform, one area of the eSchool platform includes all of the textbooks. And this includes over 5,000 different titles. Can you go back a slide, please, Mr. Quartz? Um, it includes over 5,000 titles of different textbooks. The way that a textbook in our school system is added to the eSchool Mall is after we have gone through an initial contract process and we've gotten approval and we've done the large system-wide purchase. So I'll use um, Wonders, the elementary resource, as an example. The typical process is we go first through the contract process with a new purchase of textbooks, and then after that initial rollout, we move that title into eSchool Mall so that schools have ease of access for ordering replacement materials um, for growth or for things that have been damaged. Um, Mr. Corns, is it possible to go back a slide? The eSchool, thank you. The eSchool Mall textbooks portion um, covers over 5,000 titles of these textbooks. So that includes things like all of the Wonders uh, textbooks, textbooks in 
all content areas. So business education and CTE, it includes all of the novels. So I know Ms. Pasteur will remember from her high school days and Mr. McMillian, we have tons and tons of novels. And at the end of each year, oftentimes our schools look to see which ones have gotten worn and torn and need to be replaced or which title was super popular and multiple teachers want it. So the textbooks and instructional materials section of eSchool Mall allows schools easy access to order these materials and also allows our central office the ability to supplement with our current um, funds. So for example, most recently, um, it had been quite some time since we had purchased a textbook for our AP psychology courses. Uh, we were able to use eSchool Mall um, to purchase a replacement um, this spring. It has not arrived yet because, of course, it was delayed, but um, we were able to use the eSchool Mall um, portion, this textbook contract, to purchase the AP Psych textbook. So it is a large contract because when you look across schools and the budgets that they have, as well as our budget in central office across all my different offices, so think about the ELA office purchasing novels every year to support uh, the different curricular areas. Um, think about replacing uh, wonders when we open a new school or when we um, grow and have increases enrollment. There are many, many avenues um, in which we would use this contract. So um, with Within eSchool Mall, mm -hmm. there is a specific contract for the textbook and instructional materials listed so that offices and schools can use that platform to order those core and supplemental texts, as well as um, text for professional mm -hmm. development. Right. If I may, we have, um, it's 1057, and um, I know Ms. Shea had to uh, move quickly through describing what's involved with this particular contract. I do need us to actually vote on the discovery and if we could vote on this textbook one. And then the other um, materials, again, I'll work with Dr. Williams to, to send you, much like I did with the bridges, if he would be agreeable uh, for that. Um, I know Tracy's asking me for a close. So if we could just do a quick vote and then wrap up, because I know the other committee is getting ready to start in two minutes. I have a motion for discovery. So moved. Mr. Offerman. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. A second. Second, Lisa Mack. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Um, please state your name and, and give us your vote, please. Ms. Mack? Lisa Mack, yes. Mr. McMillian? Rod McMillian, yes. Mr. Offerman? Mr. Offerman, yes. And Ms. Pastua, yes. Uh, the motion passes. Thank you. Uh, what else do you want this, us to do? I need, um, if you could, the textbook, this umbrella textbook, now right. that you understand, it's really, it's an umbrella against which all schools and offices yes. then purchase. Can I get a motion, please? So moved, Offerman. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Second. Second, Lisa Mack. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Uh, will you please call in, uh, uh, give your name and vote, please? Lisa Mack, yes. Mr. McMillian? Rod McMillian, yes. Mr. Offerman? Mr. Offerman, yes. And Ms. Pasteur, yes. Uh, the motion passes. I have sent them a text indicating that we are winding up and our apologies. <laughs> yes, thank you. I just want to personally thank the whole committee and my team. I know this was a very long committee and we didn't get through everything, uh, but it was all worthy, worthy discussion and conversation. I look forward to answering your questions um, and figuring um, how to keep our committee going in this remote context. But thank you again so very much, and I hope you have a good rest of the day. Right. Thanks to all mm -hmm. of you. Stay safe. Thank you. Yeah, thank Likewise. You very much. Thank, thank you. Stay safe.